Hey guys, I uh, hope you're doing well. I want to share some history and some details on how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was started, which was started by uh, US Public Health Service uh, Commission Corps officers. So I had provided a little snippet of history on the actual um, anniversary date of CDC, which is July 1st. Um, it's officially started July 1st, 1946, but I wanted, wanted to provide a little bit more history and detail uh, on what led up to CDC, because it wasn't just that it magically appeared on July 1st, 1946. There's a lot of buildup, and that buildup included uh, Commission Corps officers. So like many of our major public health institutions, um, the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps uh, spearheaded them and CDC is no different. So um, just gonna share some of that info here with you. This isn't everything. Uh, there are references that you can look at for more details um, in the article, but I'm just gonna share that article with a couple more details as well as I'm, as I'm just talking. So on July 1st, 1946, um, what is now known, now known as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, was officially opened in Atlanta, Georgia. But what many may not know is that the CDC was actually started by medical officers, <clears throat> excuse me, of one of, our, one of our country's uniform services, the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. I was part of that service. It was birthed from World War II and is considered, uh, the CDC was birthed from World War II and is considered by some to be the largest institutional legacy from the war. So pretty cool. The CDC's original name in 1946 was the Communicable Disease Center. So that actually made more sense because now it's <laughs> uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It should be CDCP. But anyway, original name in 1946 was Communicable Disease Center. However, much before that, the CDC was spawned from something called the Malaria Control in War Areas Program, which was administered by uh, the Public Health Service. So in order to understand uh, Malaria Control in War Areas, or MCWA, and the CDC, I think it's first important to understand a little bit about what malaria is, because fighting that disease uh, really sparked all of this. And we don't deal with that disease here in the United States. So I think it's important just to understand a little bit of that history um, to see where we've come. So malaria is an infectious disease born from an Anopheles mosquito bite. So there's different types of Anopheles species. Um, so you, you get it from this mosquito bite. And the bite contains a parasite um, that comes from the Plasmodium uh, genus. So... Uh, that parasite then infects the body um, and it can infect the body's liver, excuse me, and red blood cells. This can lead to fever, chills, and an enlarged liver and spleen in some cases. In the most severe cases, fatality rates can reach 20%. So remember as a reference that a lot of people know, COVID was hovering around 1% and that led to a lot of people dying. So <clears throat> if you can imagine, 20%, that's a pretty high fatality rate. So fun fact, the ancient Romans actually came up with the name malaria. So uh, malaria, or if you break it up in, into two words, mal aria, so malaria, so bad and, you know, aria, like um, air, so meaning bad air, malaria. Um, they didn't know the cause of the disease, so they thought it was something in the air, so so bad air. So I, I think that's kind of cool uh, to remember. Again, this, this disease has been around a long time. So malaria is usually found in tropical areas with standing water, which is where mosquitoes, as many people know, I know living here uh, in Wisconsin, that's where they're likely to live is standing water. So currently, there are about 400,000 deaths per year from malaria, but that's mostly in Africa. There has been a spike of malaria cases in the U.S., but that is from um, people the past couple of years traveling um, to the east side of the world. So going to Africa, Middle East, they get infected and then bring it back. So 
it's noted that more than 90% of those cases in the recent years, those travelers did not use chemoprophylaxis or prophylactic medication, which ironically is recommended by the CDC, which, you know, was born from uh, malaria in the U.S. So kind of funny. So malaria is found in tropical areas. So you might think that malaria would be running rampant in parts of the U.S., given that the tropical and swampy regions of the southeast um, have that environment. And you would be right uh, if it were still the 1940s. So, so let's travel back in time to the 1940s and uh, World War II. So the presence of malaria in the U.S. was problematic for soldier training. In 1940, uh, the War Department, which is our modern-day Department of Defense, the War Department had called on the Public Health Service to organize public health activities in military camps and maneuver areas, most of which were in the South, but also in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So they were probably preparing and getting ready to enter war, potentially, because of what was going on in Europe at the time. Uh, so they started getting prepared in 1940. So after the Pearl Harbor attack in 1942, funding was immediately allocated to the Public Health Service. Geez, wouldn't that be nice today? Um, public Health Service doesn't get any funding these days, but I digress. So funding was allocated to the Public Health Service to begin uh, malaria, malaria control for war areas. Um, let me get that right. Malaria control in war areas and, and CWA. So I need to... I'm just going to say MCWA from now on. Um, so it was organized, this program was organized under the State Relations Division of the Public Health Service. So think of the Public Health Service having a, an arm of it that worked with each state department to make sure that they were responding to diseases appropriately. And that department, the State Health Division, Relations Division, uh, was headed by medical officer Joseph, Dr. Joseph Mountain. Now, Dr. Mountain is often credited for creating the CDC, but there were many key players. It, it is true that he, he really spearheaded and made sure that CDC or that the MCWA became more, um, but there were other people involved, other officers. One officer, gosh, I'm like shivering in my house right now. I got the air on too much and maybe it's too much coffee too uh one officer um that i just want to share a little bit of details that we have details on is um, a medical officer and ch he was chief malariologist lewis williams jr he actually had a brother who was a phs officer as well and so dr williams had prior malaria control experience in world war one and so he kind of took the helm of the malaria control for war areas program initially. So he was in charge of an MCWA, again, under Dr. Mountain, who was really ultimately in charge of, of that, that program because he was in charge of the state relations division. Um, but Dr. Williams really took the helm. Uh, in 1941, he was under the direction of medical officer Henry Rose Carter, who also had World War I experience with malaria control in the, in the article. On PHS Proud, you can see a picture of him kind of doing some inspection, which is kind of cool. So Dr. Williams was under his um, uh, direction, and Dr. Williams was assigned to one of the Army's most malaria-ridden stations, the 4th Service Command in Atlanta. So um, he had worked there, and by 1942, they had achieved the lowest rate of infection in the Army at 0 0.6 per 1,000 men per year. I don't know what it was before that, but apparently they achieved uh, the, the lowest rate of infection, which is pretty cool. Um, so Dr. Williams, uh, then in 1943, he was supposed to be assigned to the Surgeon General of the Army to help prepare a war area in Algeria for the invasion of Italy, but actually had a heart attack, which prevented him from going. Um, but it's pretty cool. Apparently he was super dedicated and and wanted to help out and he helped organize the mission from his bed while he was recovering so uh, i also have a picture of lewis l williams jr um 
in the article as well. Uh, I couldn't find one of him in uniform, but there's a picture of him when he's a little bit older. So um, Dr. Williams was another officer that was involved with a lot of um, uh, support with the military. Uh, so kind of cool story there. Um, and he, again, he was the chief malariologist and really was leading the physician side of things um, uh, for MCWA. So um, let's talk a little bit about the MCWA impact on on war and and just the infectious disease expertise that was created, which again, eventually led to the CDC. So from 1942 to 1943, uh, the MCWA served 900 and then increased to 1,161 war establishments for the Army and Navy throughout 21 states, uh, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. So pretty cool. Like the, this was involved in, um, in a lot of, uh, throughout the military in it in all of these areas. So pretty cool. Um, The MCWA approach involved collaboration between medicine, engineering, and entomology. There were, the public health service with this program had over 3,000 laborers. Now these of course weren't commission personnel, but uh, just, uh, you know, workers working for the government. Um, So 3,000 laborers for malaria control work. They were supervised by engineers, entomologists, and physicians. So physicians treated cases in the field, but most of the work was done by engineers and entomologists. So they drained swamps by digging ditches, and larvicide was a major emphasis with Paris Green being the first agent. They used diesel oil and then DDT. They would actually be spraying in the houses, um, excuse me, the DDT, which is kind of funny because now we know DDT is toxic um, and of note. DDT has been banned as of 1972, but again, at, at the time in World War II, uh, that wasn't known, and, and that's what they were using. So engineers um, and entomologists were really the heroes, and again, this is a public health approach, controlling the environment to prevent disease down the road. So um, during the war, there were very few malaria specialists, so MCWA began its own training program, and this essentially fed its own internal expertise for training on infectious disease, which helped plant the seed for the eventual development of CDC. So um, as an example, in anticipation of troops returning from tropical areas, it, it expanded its training program to learn about tropical diseases like um, Aedes aegypti, which is, a, um, I believe, the mosquito vector that um, uh, is involved in yellow fever and dengue. Um, And then in 1944, they also expanded training and research to typhus. Uh, In 1945, malaria control extended beyond just military areas into other regions. So it wasn't just focused for the military. It was then um, focused to to control um, other areas. So in short, MCWA began, began with expertise in malaria And then through its own internal training and expertise, it naturally grew to control other infectious diseases. It began responding to health department's requests for infectious disease concerns like amoeba in Alabama. And it's important to remember that MCWA was under the state relations division of PHS. So it it, it had the relations with the state health departments to begin with, which facilitated, again, this, this ability to respond to state health departments need for infectious disease control. So all these, all, these, all these things kind of organically uh, grew and just made sense um, and evolved with time. So as the war ended, um, I just want to make sure, too, that I mention just a quick pause. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the end of the war here, um, but I want to point out that at the end of uh, fiscal year 1945, malaria was essentially eradicated from the U.S., so that's pretty cool. Um, by 1945, there's no more malaria to, to be worried about, so a huge accomplishment. So as the war ended, um, you know, it, it would be expected that MCWA, Malaria Control for War Areas, would be closed out. But again, they had developed all this expertise in infectious disease, so don't want it to go to waste, right? So 
Um, remember Dr. Joseph Mountain, um, as the war ended, uh, this, this program was under his division in the public health service. So he wanted to create a center that helped states eradicate infectious diseases. He didn't want it to compete with the National Institute of Health, NIH. So he left the word institute out of the name when he was creating the center. He was actually prepared to debate his um, PHS colleague and medical officer, Dr. Uh, Rola Dyer, who was the NIH director at the time. All the directors of, of these institutions used to be commission corps officers. Um, and then that stopped uh, after 1970, after the passing of, um, I believe, the um, National Cancer Act. Anyway, that's an aside. But so he was getting ready to debate his colleague, Dr. Dyer, another medical officer at this meeting with the Surgeon General Thomas Perrin. Um, and he was, I didn't include this in the article, but um, in some of the articles I was reading, um, Dr. Mountain was actually preparing to debate him and like rehearsing exactly what he was going to say. And as he went into the meeting with Dr. Dyer, his colleague, he wasn't, Dr. Dyer wasn't putting up any fight to what he was going to say. So he was, Dr. Mountain was so prepared to have this happen that he was almost um, straw manning or steel manning. I don't know the term, but himself and <laughs> because he was um, making sure that he answered his own arguments uh, because he was so prepared to debate him. And then he wasn't, his, his colleague didn't debate him. So he was like almost trying to convince his colleague to debate him. And I don't know, it's just kind of funny the way that it's described in the article. But um, needless to say, uh, they decided that this new center, the CDC, was going to focus on disease control and NIH on research. CDC eventually went, on, went beyond disease control, for better or for worse, um, and does research as well, which may be to its detriment these days because I think they kind of have outgrown their bridges a little bit. Um, so anyway, that reminds me of another article that um, was just published by another former, former PHS officer um, that talks about how CDC should be reformed. So um, anyway, I'm getting distracted with all this interesting information. So there's, a, there's another picture on, in the article, too, um, where you can check out um, a, a cool picture of um, the Surgeon General Thomas Perrin. Uh, Joseph Mountain is in the picture on the left, and then um, his colleague, Dr. Dyer, is also there. That wasn't the actual meeting, I don't think, where they had, had the meeting and debate, I don't think, but you, you could imagine it'd be something like that. So when the CDC began on July 1st, 1946, interesting to know that the first ever executive director was an engineering officer, USPHS Commission Corps officer, Mark Hollis. He was also very instrumental during MCWA during the war. Um, he has some interesting stories as well that I didn't put in the article, but he was also a key player in the development of this program, NC MCWA. So he was actually the first executive director of CDC when it was officially the CDC. Um, and so malaria was the focus in the first couple of years, um, but it soon added a veterinarian division in 1947. And then it also took over the San Francisco Plague Laboratory that the Public Health Service had. Um, so San Francisco had a lot of um, control work being done for plague. There's a whole other story with the Surgeon General Rupert Blue fighting plague there. Um, he was a hero there in San Francisco, um, so I, I encourage you to check that out. But the CDC eventually took over that laboratory because um, they had an epidemiology program there, and that became the CDC's epidemiology program. And everybody knows now that, you know, the infamous CDC epidemiologists. Um, so just kind of cool. Again, this is all coming from public health service. Um, the CDC became involved in other public health problems like diarrhea, um, diarrheal diseases and polio as well. So again, just kind of evolving after it got started in, um, after, after 1946, it kind of took on more stuff, handling more diseases. In 1947, Emory University, Emory University, excuse me, uh, donated 15 acres of land on Clifton Road to the Public Health Service um, to create a new center already uh, for the CDC. But due to delays, the new center wasn't fully ready until 1960. CDC's mission continued to broaden from insect control to medicine and biomedical science. 
again, for better or for worse. And accordingly, the number of medical commissioned officers increased from seven in 1946 at the end of World War II to 63 in 1952. So there's an increase in commissioned officers being assigned there. Venereal disease programs were added in 1957 and tuberculosis in 1960. So again, just through the years growing and adding more uh, infectious disease expertise to its repertoire. So uh, with the scope of CDC extending beyond just infectious disease to nutrition, chronic disease, and occupational and, and environmental health uh, came some name changes. So in 1967, the name changed to the National Communicable Disease Center. In, 19, in 1970, it changed to Center for Disease Control. In 1980, big change, Centers for Disease Control. And then in 1992, finally, it changed to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So a lot of name changes, and, and now it's um, uh, what, what we all know today is Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That's, that's the final name. So a pretty cool history and story, I think. Again, commissioned officers being at the helm of a lot of these programs for the mal malaria control for war areas, MCWA, began this expertise in infectious disease and it grew into the CDC and now the CDC is the public health authority that Americans think of today coming and again CDC came from its humble beginning in MCWA during World War II so pretty cool um, so needless to say I hope you enjoyed uh, that history and, and details there's more stuff again there's some references I encourage you to check out in the in the article um, but the effort and influence of the Commission Corps um, should not be understated. Uh, the CDC came from um, officers in the field um, who had spearheaded these programs, um, and it led to this, this thing that all Americans know for the most part these days, but no Americans really know about the Public Health Service Commission Corps. So I uh, hope you enjoyed, and until next time.